So, um, let me ask you a couple of questions. What language do you speak at uh, your school? At school? English. English. Mm -hmm. English and Spanish. English and Spanish. English, Spanish, and 1% French. 1% French, okay? Mostly English, right? And uh, you learn some little bit of Spanish uh, and French. Good. Now, what, guy, what language do you guys speak at home? Yes? Telugu. Uh, um, Telugu. Telugu and English combined, probably, right? Telugu and English combined. Tamil English. Tamil English combined. 80% English, 20% Yeah, okay. Now, some of you, uh, when you go to India, you, your grandparents, right? What do they speak? You went to India recently, right? Your uncles and aunts and cousins, what language do they speak? Uh -huh. Telugu, right? We all speak different languages. My question, my real question to you is, what language do you think the nature speaks? Uh -huh. The nature. The nature. Na you know what is nature is? Nature is with all things around us, the trees, the flowers, the fruits, the planets, the universe. Do you know if it speaks any language? French. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> That's a good one, okay. Um, nothing. Nothing. Yes? No. Mad. But it's true. The nature has a language. Now, what do you mean by that? Does it really speak with words and does it have a mouth? No, right? It expresses itself through the language of math through what we call as patterns, right? So we, if we observe carefully, we will see that. We will see that it is actually speaking. Now, what do we mean by that? Let me give some concrete examples, okay? Yes? Well, um, it snows a lot in winter and it's sunny most of the time in summer, so that's kind of a pattern. Correct, there's a pattern, that's a, exactly. And uh, every day sun wake, uh, comes in the morning and uh, it goes down the evening night, right, there's a pattern, but also there's a pattern of, as you go through the summer, right, the days get longer, and as you go through the winter, it gets shorter, it's the same follow the same pattern every year, seasons, right, there's all patterns, right, there, so there is natural patterns in that, yes, that's a good point. There's See? like patterns in the moon, the moon, like how they sing. Right, whether it initially, you know, uh, it, you can't see it at all, then you can see a little bit, then the full moon to, uh, you know, Excellent, yeah. Every four years we add another day. Leap years, every four years it's for the same pattern every four years of that, right? So there are patterns everywhere. That's what we mean. But let me also show you even more concrete examples, okay? Okay. Everybody see this? Do you, do you all know what, what is this? It's a pineapple. It's a pineapple. Did you ever eat a pineapple? I don't like pineapple. You don't like pineapple. Part okay. Of the we just today. You just ate it today, right? So but everybody saw one, right? Before? Yeah. Okay. So let me show you the map in the in a pineapple, okay? So, what I'm going to do is first count number of rows of uh, these things, right? The rings, okay? Um, I actually count these gaps between them, but you got to count carefully because it's not a straight line. It's kind of goes up and down, but you can see that there's a there's kind of lines, right? So there's one, Two, right? Three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay? The eight rows. Let's see the diagonals. Now, what I mean by diagonal? If you look at, we thought it is rows, but if you see carefully, they're actually more spiral. If they start, if it starts here, can you see that they all, it goes in a spiral pattern like this, right? They are more spiral than actually rows. So let's count number of spirals. So let me write what we found so far though. Pineapples. Rows. Okay? Eight of them, right? Let's find the number of diagonals. I have to count this one because I need to keep track of where I started so that I need to end it. So this is one, right? It goes all the way from there to here, right? So that's one. I'll keep my finger here. Two goes all the way, right? Three, 
फोर फाइव सिक्स बट इट स्टार्टिंग लाइट दिक्स वन स्टार्टिंग ऑन रही है सेवन एट नाइन टेन लेवन ट्वेल्व एंड थर्टी एंड देन After thirteen, it matches with the original one, right? So the thirteen. So number of diagonals, pineapples, number of diagonals is thirteen. Okay? Doesn't look anything special, right? It's just numbers. Okay. So let me show you something else. Okay. Uh, what is this? Rose, right? Rose flower. Let's try to count the number of petals. In the rows, but we're not going to count all the petals. You know how, how the flowers grow? They start with a bud, maybe initially just with a one seed initially, and then it kind of goes in a kind of spiral, right? They really, but they come in layers, right? What I'm going to count is number of petals in a in a layer. So there's one, two, and three. If you look at just the outer layer, there's one. There are three. Then similarly, if you go one more layer, there are three. They go in a In in the combinations of three per layer, okay. So the number of it could initially look like there's nothing, look like grand number of right. So let's see, rose petals. Number of rose petals is three. There's not nothing common so far. Did anybody see this earlier? You know what is this? Oh, it is actually a, a pine, a pine flower. You don't usually see a pine flower. You see pine cones. Do you know what is this? You probably are more familiar with the brown version of this. This is a pine cone. This is a pine cone, but it did not drop from. So I just got it from a backyard pine tree. So it's a, you are, are familiar with the brown uh, pine cones when they fall down, right? Mm -hmm. Right. This is just a green version of that. I wanted to get a clearer version, so I got the green one, but it's just a pine cone. And a pine cone actually comes out of this pine flower. If you see inside, before it grows, finally, originally it's just a bud. Next time when you go near the pine tree, or then your backyard, some somebody's background, so initially it will be like a bud. As it opens, it it's a, becomes flower, and inside the pine cone grows like like this. And initially it's just a cream color. And then when the flower petals fall off, it will become green. And eventually, when it falls off, so it will become brown. That is what we are familiar with. But that is how this is how the process goes. But what I wanted to count now is the number of petals in a layer. Okay. So, but I, so if you, and in the morning when I had the class, actually it was, <laughs> it was close and nice. I opened it up. So, if you see how many petals are there in the inner. Part one, two, three, and similarly, we see there's actually one more layer. It's not clear now because I, I put it. To, so this is this is a second layer with three, and then there is a third layer with three, right? So there is a number of petals in a in a pine flower. Pine flower petals. Lots of three. How about the pine cone itself? Let's look at the pine cone. The pine cone, interestingly, also has petals. Okay, it all starts with a small seed. Is it interesting? And the the seed becomes a bud. And within the bud, inside the bud, there's a cone, but outside there's a flower. The flower has certain petals. Petals which always follow the same pattern. They always have three layers of three. Next time, observe that. Even rose, it always has three. If you want to count the number of spirals, okay, it's hard to count on this. But one way to count is this. Do you see these black things? Okay, they are the. One. So if you count 
the, just the top layer, the number of, uh, of those black things, that will eventually become the number of spirals. So, but I just need to count the outer ones, not the inner ones, because inner ones are part of the next spiral. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So there are eight spirals in a pine cone. Pine cone spiral is eight. Then you see the tree appeared twice, eight appeared twice, and thirteen once. Still, there's not much of a pattern, right? Now uh, here I have sunflower. Observe this carefully. I'm not looking at the petals now, I'm looking at this. If you observe these inner ones carefully, right? Are they straight? Are they growing in straight line? No. Observe it. They're actually in spirals. Just watch carefully. It's like, there's actually, if you watch from this direction like a spiral, from this direction also like a spiral. They're like a double spiral. Okay? So if I want to count the number of spirals, it's much harder you to keep track of each of the spirals. So I'll start here with my finger here. One, and I'm going to, trying to count the number of spirals. It's much like bigger number, so be patient. One, two, three, four, five. I'm looking at this entire spiral. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, I counted earlier in the morning also, so I know how many, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, there are 55 spirals. What's come, right? There's there doesn't appear to be anything common. So sunflower spirals is 55. Nothing common, right? Now, what I want, I want to show you now is I'll write number pattern here and see whether these numbers have anything to do with the pattern I'm writing. Okay? Well, observe carefully. One, one, two, three, five, six. First of all, see what, what this pattern means. How do, how do you, you know patterns, right? You can see like two, four, six, eight, ten, they are even numbers. You take two, five, eight, they're counting by threes, right? But see what kind of pattern this. One, one, two, three, five, eight, thirteen, 21, 34, 55, and so on, right? So some of you see that part, yes, Rishi? The pattern is from 1 to 1, it's 0, from 1 to 2, it's 1, from 2 to 3, it's 1, from 3 to 5, it's 2, from 5 to 8, it's 3, from 8 to 13, it's 5. So what is, what is the pattern? How do you, what is the It difference? increases by 1. Increases by 1. 5 to 8 is not increasing by 1. 5 to 8 is 3. 8 to 3, 15 is 5. It increases by an odd number each time. 13 to 20, what is it? 21 minus 13. That's not an odd number. 6. 8. It's actually 8. 21 minus 13, right? What do you think? So 1 plus 1 is 2, then 1 plus 2 is 3, then 2 plus 3 is 5. Right. Yeah. So if you, the pattern is add any two numbers to get the next number. See, is that what you are about to say? So 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, 2 plus 3 is 5, 
3 plus 5 is 8, 5 plus 8 is 13, 8 plus 13 is 21, 31 plus 21 is 34, 21 plus 34 is 55. Okay? It's an interesting pattern. Now, what is this pattern has to do with these numbers? Do you see that all those numbers are part of this pattern? They are members of the pattern, right? Why would sunflowers, pineapples, pine cones, rose flowers would follow this pattern? What's common? Right. By the way, anybody knows the name for this sequence? There's a name for it. You see? Fibonacci. Fibonacci. So the name of the sequence is Fibonacci. Did anybody hear the name Fibonacci earlier other than Sri? You never heard that? Okay. We'll talk about this. So it's called Fibonacci sequence. So what is special about this vision of Fibonacci sequence, or Fibonacci pattern, or Fibonacci numbers? What is so special about this? Yes? Um, the numbers from the pattern of nature are in that sequence. Right. Many things in the nature follow this. Not everything. Okay? It's not that nature follows always Fibonacci, but many things do follow. But why? Why do nature cares about Fibonacci sequence? Is it a friend of Fibonacci? Who is Fibonacci? But anyway. Right? So, yes? Fibonacci is um, a mathematician. He's a mathematician. Actually, he's not really a mathematician, though, although today maybe you can call that. He's a very interesting story. So let's visit the story of Fibonacci. Okay? The Fibonacci is actually a 13th century trader. What do you mean trader? So, he lived in Italy. Uh, he's actually born in Italy, 13th century, 12, early 13th century, like 1200 to 1203 years old. And uh, he, at the time, it's an interesting time in Europe. Anybody knows why? What is special about 13th century? Renaissance. Hmm? I think it's Renaissance. Renaissance came a little after that. The Renaissance started more like 14th, 15th centuries. Did they start exploring the world? That actually started after Renaissance. That's a little after that. This is slightly before that. <coughs> and we'll talk about the history a little bit with the timelines, but at a high level, don't worry about that for now. Uh, this is the time when his, Europe is coming out of what are known as the Dark Ages. You heard the word Dark Ages for Europe? Was it during the Black Death? Black Death actually happened li right after this, more like the 14th century, mid 14th century. This, this uh, the, From the period from about 500 AD, to about 13th century AD is kind of 12 to 13th century AD is called dark ages uh, in Europe. Now that's only applicable to Europe. In other parts of the world, there are a lot of interesting things happen. But the history is written by victors, and most of the history is written by Europeans. Europeans who explore the world, who and today is most of the culture. Why everybody speaks English? Because Britain went and conquered a lot of other countries and they adapted the language, right? Uh, so, and Europe's history is written very well. The history of other other uh, places are not written as well. But uh, so we're talking. So we will visit a lot of his uh, European history for that reason. So this person, his real name is Leonardo of Pisa. Leonardo of Pisa, not the pizza as in the, the pizza that we eat. It's actually P-I-S-A, but it's pronounced like pizza. It's a city in Italy, and his real name is Leonardo. Leonardo of Pisa is his name. Fibonacci in Italian means the son of Bonacci. His father's name was Bonacci. So that's what Fibonacci is. That's his nickname. Everybody knows him by, knows him by his, his nickname. This person was very curious. He was actually trading with Arabs. Now, I plan to bring the map. Uh, I'll show the map next year. Everybody knows the Europe map with the Mediterranean Sea in the middle. Yeah. Europe is to the north of it, and then to the south of it, you have North Africa and mid and uh, northwest part of uh, uh, Asia, which is called West Asia, right? Mm -hmm. And so the Arab world, uh, one of the countries is called Phoenicia, which is today I think uh, Lebanon, Lebanon and Libya. Uh, it's part of North Africa and West Asia, and uh, it was called as Phoenicia in those days. And they are very strong in trading. They used to trade with Europe because right across the Mediterranean. And the Arabs in turn are connected uh, through, uh, through rest of Asia, especially to India. There is a lot of trade between India and Arabs. 
Uh, and when this person went off, went to uh, cross the cross the Mediterranean, traded with them, learned things from Arabs, and when he came back, he published a book. He learned a lot of things, and one of them published was an interesting problem in his book. And we're going to see a demo of that in a second. Uh, actually, let's do that first. Okay. The problem that, that uh, this person Leonardo of Pisa only said, there are a pair of rabbits initially. There are a peculiar pair of rabbits. After they're born, after one month, they, uh, they mature. Okay? That orange line means they mature. Meaning that after that, they will actually every month, they will give birth to another pair of rabbits. Okay? So, uh, where is the second one? First month, there is one pair. Second month, also there is one pair because they, not, they did not give birth to any. But if you go to, after one more month, Right? They still survive, but the yellow means a new pair is born. Now how many pairs do we have? We have two pairs of rabbits, right? Or the original pairs plus the new pair. And let's go to the fourth month. In the fourth month, the original world will still survive. In this problem, the original rabbits will survive. They will survive infinitely. Now in reality it doesn't happen, right? It's a math problem that we posed. The original one still survives, but because they are mature, they also give birth to another pair of rabbits. But the old one, the, the, the pair that was born, now mature. So the next time they are ready to give birth. So let's go to next month, fifth month. And by the way, how many pairs were there in the fourth month? Three, right? You guys see that? In the next month, you continue the same pattern. How many are there? Five. Next month, continue the same pattern. Eight. Next month, and try this by your own, uh, draw it at home and you will get this pattern. 13. Do you see this? Notice that the same as this pattern. Okay? That is the original problem that he posed that led to the sequence. That it is named after him. Okay? You can keep continuing. And, uh, and because he popularized the sequence in Europe and it is named after his Fibonacci sequence. Although he is not the first person to actually uh, describe this pattern in history. That credit goes to an Indian mathematician by name Pingala. You might not have heard. He's not, he's not he's an Indian scholar, he did a lot of other things. Not, many of them are not pure, pure mathematicians. In those days, it's not that mathematicians just did mathematics, right? They, they did a lot of other things. Then they, those who, they also found a few things like this. And Pingala in 4th century BC, which was almost 1600 years before, before Fibonacci. He wrote a book called Chanda Shastra, which is written in Sanskrit in India. In, the, in those days, classical things are written in Sanskrit. And, um, and he described the sequence. Obviously, not called Fibonacci because he, he was before Fibonacci. Uh, he described that in a text, which was later interpreted in the 9th century, that is about Three to four hundred years before uh, Fibonacci stuff by another mathematician, Indian mathematician, who actually described that poor Pengala did this. But Europe is not aware of that. That's probably he got introduced, and Arabs might have read those books, and Arabs probably introduced them to Fibonacci or Leonardo. Uh, but the Leonardo's book is what got popular in Europe. And so everybody called it Fibonacci sequence, right? But, uh, so, it was, the history of Fibonacci sequence was long before Fibonacci, but he's the one who popularized, so his name remains. Okay? And because of the, uh, uh, and uh, by the way, another thing uh, that he introduced in his, the same book actually, okay, is, uh, let me ask you a question. Do you know what numbers Europe followed until about 13th, 14th centuries? Today we follow 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, these numbers, right? Yes? Which one? Roman numerals. Roman numerals, absolutely correct. So, you remember Roman numerals? Did you guys do it in action? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, I observe a couple of things. One, there is no 0 in this. Two, even more difficult part is, if you want to write a big number like 
13,486. Do you know how awkward it is to write in Roman numerals? It will become very long number. Because it is not like this. We just wrote it five digits. In Roman numerals, it will become very long. It is very difficult to remember. But that is how you followed it till then. This number sequence was actually, including the zero, was actually invented by Indian mathematicians. And in India, it is used very regularly. And Arabs, because they trade a lot with India, and in fact, they also fought wars with India, they actually conquered a lot of part of India uh, in those years, in those, uh, this is before British went to India. Uh, they learned from India, they translated, but they started using, Arabs were using it heavily. And our friend Fibonacci went there, he learned, and he introduced these, room, these numerals to uh, Europe. And that's why I'm everybody, rest of the world, later followed European numbers because Europe uh, went and conquered the rest, most of the world, right? So everybody followed that. One way it's good, right? Everybody now has one, one English language that most people understand, one kind of number that everybody follows. If everybody follows a different kind of, kind of numbers, it's hard to you know, talk to each other, right? So that's how we today end up with these numbers. These numbers were actually invented in India where your grandparents live, but it came to us through Europe, through Arabs and through Europe, through our friend Fibonacci. But the, he also posed that problem, and what is interesting about this problem is, when he posed that problem, he did not know a lot of other interesting things about that sequence. That came in the only last few decades or few centuries. We found that this is actually happened to be a very interesting sequence, not for the reason Fibonacci posed, not for the reason Pingala described, but there are a lot of things in nature actually follow this nature, this pattern. Let's see a few more things, okay? For example, what I'm going to uh, show, introduce to you another concept now, okay? Uh, let me give you a few graph sheets. Turn your graph paper Horizontal like this. Turn it like this. Hold it like horizontally like this. Okay? And press one button. So somewhere around this corner, not at the top, not on the left, somewhere here around this, draw a one unit square. Do you guys know how to do? These are all squares, right? Just count one, one. Each of them is one unit, just like that. One small square. Can everybody see this? If you can't see, you can come closer here. Raghavir, if you want to come, you can also come closer. So you can clear it. Okay? Draw one unit square like that. Okay? Everybody got one? Press one more. Now next to, to the right of that, draw one more unit square. Just touching that, one more unit square. Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. Now what I want you to do is, press one more, uh, draw a square touching the other two. So now it will be two unit square, right? Because the bottom of these two together is two units and make a square with two units. So there will be two by two square. Everybody got that? No, not two by two square. Two by two square. Erase this bottom part. Just watch that. 2 by 2 square. So the bottom should be 2. Right? Now, if you look at the whole thing together, that's also a rectangle. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at the entire thing together, what is the length of the rectangle? 3. three. 2 plus 1. What is the width of the rectangle? 2. The 3 by 2 rectangle. Right? Okay. So plus 1 more. Continue the same. Now to the right of it, okay, now because the length of the, uh, the rectangle was 3, make a square, a 3 by 3 square. Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I think, did you get what I'm going to ask next? So, th yeah, this length is 500, 3 plus 2. Draw another square, a 5 by square. 
5 by 5 square at the above that. Right? So, see that? Can anybody guess what I'm going to ask next? Yes, sure. Exactly, 8 by 8 square to the right of that. Right? Because, sorry, to the top of that. So this is uh, 5, sorry, to the right of that, yeah. This is 5 plus 3, so now it will be 8 by 8 square, right? To the right or? To the right. To the left, I mean, yeah. I mean, oh, sorry, to the left, to I'm sorry. your left, yeah. No, no, to the, your left, yeah. To my right view. Okay. If you finish that, did you notice anything interesting with those numbers, lengths of the the squares? Yes? They are Fibonacci numbers. Because we are doing 1 plus 1, 2, 1 plus 2, 3, 2 plus 3, 5, right? But there's something even more interesting about it. Okay, let me show you that. So, uh, let me write the Fibonacci sequence again. Okay, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, and so on, right? And each of the uh, each of the unit square, square length, side lengths are one of the Fibonacci numbers, right? 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 9, in the same order. But if you also notice, each rectangle that is formed, right, has a side lengths that are consecutive Fibonacci numbers. If you look at the, the rectangle that is formed by the two small unit squares, it has a length of 2 and width of 1. So, there is a rectangle of 1, 1, 2, right? 1 being the width and 2 being the length. Then, the next rectangle that is formed has a length of 3 and width of 2. So, these two are one rectangle, these two are another rectangle. Then, you had a 3 by 5, 5 by 8, 8 by 13. And that's where we are right now, right? This has a length of 8, as a width of 8 and length of 13, right? Now, I'm going to introduce you, before going to the next one, uh, I'm going to introduce you, uh, how many of you know what a ratio is? Everybody knows what a ratio is? Um, kind. Kind of? Okay. Fraction. Okay. A ratio is like a fraction. When you take two numbers, one of them divide by the other. You can also describe ratio like, let's look at this class. How many of you? There are five kids. How many boys and how many girls? Three boys and two girls. So, so what is the ratio of girls to boys? Two, two, three. Girls to boys is two to three. What is the ratio of boys to the total class? Three to five. Three to five. Boys to total class is three to five. Right? You see that? That's ratio. Everybody understand that, right? A ratio can also be written as a fraction. And call it 3 by 5. And you can even say, uh, we can find the number, you can write it as a decimal number 2, like a fraction of decimal, right? Okay? So let's try to find these ratios. Let's find, try to find the ratio of each of these length to width, okay, of each of these rectangles. Okay? If you take the smaller rectangle in each of the 2 to 1, right? The length of 2 and width to 1, what is its ratio? 2 divided by 1 is? Two. two. If you go to the next rectangle, three by two, right? Three by two is equal to one point five, right? I'm going to just write it as a decimal to make it easy. Now this is not a calculation class, so I'm, I'm going to use a calculator. So I just want to do, uh, show you something. I'm going to just do my calculator on this and write down the value of each of these ratios. So 3 to 2 is 1. 5 to 3 is 5 divided by 3 equals 1.666 is recurring a denominator recurring decimal? 
1.6 bar is called bar. And something if we approximate it called 1.67 is only 2. 6, 7. And 6 bar. Right? Everybody knows that? 8 divided by 5. 8 divided by 5 is so the ratio this is 1.6 actually. There is no bar. Just like 8 by 5 is 1.6. 13 by 8. What is the ratio of 13 divided by 8? That is 1 point actually 1.625. How about 21 divided by 13? 21 divided by 13 is 1.615 and it keeps going. How about 21 divided by 34? Sorry, 34 divided by 24. 34 divided by 21 is 1.619 keeps going. How about 35 divided, sorry, 55 divided by 34? 55 divided by 34, 1.617. How about 89 divided by 55? One point 1.618. What, what do you think is happening? Oh, 1.6. There are 1.6. If I read the next one, what number do you think is going to be close? Let's see. 1.613 So this is next is 144 So 144 divided by 89 one, What do you? 1 1.619 point? One point So actually 1.6179 which is very close to 8 If I write the next one what do you think? So the approximate this is 233 233 divided by 144. Can you get, can you approximate? 1.618. Is actually 1.61805. If you notice, it is becoming closer and closer and closer to something very close to 1.618. Right? That number actually is a very interesting one. This is called golden ratio. It's a very very interesting number in nature. Okay. Why is it interesting? Why? Hmm? This the ratio of two Fibonacci numbers, two consecutive Fibonacci numbers, as you go keep going up and up, it gets closer to a number. Okay? In fact, if I draw a graph of the ratio, right, one, one, like Fibonacci consecutive numbers, you started with two actually. Right? This is two. This is one. Okay. It's out of 2, 1.5, the graph would look something like this. As you get closer, you are actually getting closer, it may, I may not be getting clearly, but it's getting closer and closer to a number here, which is 1.618 something. Okay? That ratio, this will never end. It's not that if you ask me what is the value of it, you will not know because it will keep going forever. Such numbers are called irrational numbers. Did everybody, anybody know what is an irrational number? Do you know what is a rational number? Yes, hey, sorry? A number that can be written as a fraction. Right. Oh. You want, want to say the same, same thing? I thought it was like supposed to be equal, kind of. No, a rational number is, okay? is defined as a number that can be written as a ratio of two different integers. For example, 2 by, uh, I take, okay, I take 1.5. Is it rational? Is it rational because it can be written as 3 divided by 2. It can be written as a fraction of two different integers. Right? If I take this 1.6 bar, 1.6666 going forever, okay, uh, 1.6 bar, is this a rational number? It is because it is written, can be written as a ratio of 5 divided by 3. Okay? If we take this number, you cannot exactly write as a fraction of two different numbers. But it is approximated by, approximate, estimate, you can estimate it by a ratio of two different Fibonacci numbers. The bigger the numbers, closer it gets to that particular, you can never uh, really find it. There is another rational number. Do you all know about pi? Yes. 
In fact, there's a very interesting story about pi. We'll talk about that in the third class. But the, what is the value of pi? 22 over 7. 20, okay, he says 22 over 7. Yes? I don't think there is a number for that. Okay, that's a good answer. So, what is the close number? 22 divided by 7. Okay, that's an approximation. Any other answers? 3.14. 3.14. Yes, see? 3.14. 3.14. They're all good answers. In fact, you cannot exactly answer because it will keep going forever. It does not stop. Nor does it wake up. Okay? Nor does it, it does not repeat. Any number that goes where decimals will keep going forever without recurring, without repeating, they're called irrational numbers. And pi is one such number. But golden ratio is another such number. And the golden ratio occurs so many times in nature. It happens so often. Uh, in fact, if you look at that particular, uh, you can keep expanding, you will do that right. Keep, you don't need to write, but just watch a few more. Press some more time. So we just continue that, right? That rectangle one more time. One more time. One more time. Okay. So you can keep going forever. You can make a bigger and bigger rectangle. The ratio of the length to width is what we're trying to find here. That will become closer and closer to golden ratio. If you observe carefully, and if you draw a spiral, if you start at the midpoint of this and go to midpoints of each of them, how, how do you think the figure, the picture that comes looks like a spiral? And that spiral has, is very important for the pineapple, pine cone, or the sunflower. The spirals that we saw here actually came out of that. That's called golden ratio. At this point, to really appreciate that, I want to show you on video, actually a movie. Okay, is that uh, golden angle. 
which comes out of golden ratio. And when it does that, the number of spirals will always be Fibonacci number. Because the golden ratio, as we've seen that in the rectangle, right, is formed with Fibonacci number. And the reason it, uh, it follows that is the most efficient way for nature to do that. Um, how many of you heard about uh, theory of evolution? Probably you may not have. Darwin, did you ever know about Darwin or theory of evolution? Some of you did, right? So, uh, that comes in science, you learn more about as you grow. Uh, and uh, Darwin is created for, uh, created for that, but a lot of other scientists actually researched also on similar subjects. They wrote similar ones, but he wrote a very popular book in Europe around 1850. He went on the Galapagos Island and he found a lot of examples. And the theory that he came up with uh, is called the theory of evolution. And where he said that there was a question for a long time, as long as human beings existed. How did we come to be? Where did we start? How did human beings start? What is the beginning of life? Right? People wanted to ask the question. And the usual answer, until probably around 1500, 1600 years, uh, around 1500, 1600 AD, was uh, God formed us. God created us, right? And even today we believe that many of us, uh, there is a belief, right? Uh, every religion uh, has a particular uh, theory about it. Hinduism teaches about how God created people uh, through different yugas. If you you can talk to your parents or grandparents, Christianity talked about how God created Adam and Eve, and then others came, right? That was the belief. But when a few hundred years back, many scientists started finding evidence that look, in fact, to be fair, probably a few thousand years back, also there are some people who are scientifically oriented who are not just in. Uh, you can't just go with belief, religious belief, you have to actually need a proof. And they came up with uh, a number of theories, eventually, when the Dar and it came to Darwin, he kind of put it together all of that. And he got trade for that. And, uh, and one, of, one part of his theory is that we all started probably with a single cell. The life on the earth probably started with a single cell. But increasingly it became bigger, more complicated, more cell organisms maybe amoebas, bacteria, and then slightly bigger objects, then uh, at some point bigger <coughs> animals and uh, monkeys from monkeys, maybe chimpanzees from chimpanzees, uh, eventually to human beings. Human beings, which is formed through archaeological evidence. Do you know what is archaeology? Have you heard of archaeology? Yes? The study of things in the past. In the past, yeah. So uh, scientists actually dig uh, some uh, sites where they can find evidence because things get buried over thousands of years, right? And by burying, uh, they can dig that out and then there is a scientific thing called carbon aging through which they can find how old is that object. And because of which you can tell when did it live, right? Then you can, you may predict, uh, oh, 10,000 years back, these kind of people lived, these kind of animals lived. 60, 165 million years ago, uh, dinosaurs lived. How do you know that by our 65 million years ago? How do you know that? Because they found that it happened up to that, but after that, you don't find any evidence of them, so they got wiped out. All those theories come out, right? Based on archaeology. Human beings are found to be not probably around, came on uh, around, probably around 100,000 years ago. That looks like a long time back, but if you look the, the history of Earth, which is probably found to be about 5 billion years old ago, and the history of the universe, which is predicted to be about 15 billion years ago, we are time, the 100,000 years is small. Suddenly when you look at it, we look very small, right? right? The 100 or less than 100 years that we live look like a small period in the bigger picture. But uh, one of the uh, uh, important parts of uh, uh, Darwin's theory is that the survival of the fittest, meaning uh, many different organisms, probably there are many different followers that might have come, but the only those which were the most efficient could survive. Others just died, other species just disappeared. So, by following the specific ratio and the specific angle, which came out of the Fibonacci number, right, they are able to perhaps this is the highest sunlight and hence they could survive. Even in the trees you can see that the, uh, on this tree leaf, 
You don't see a second leaf right below the first leaf. It comes at an angle because they both can receive sunlight. The angle that is followed by most spirals is that ratio so that either they can receive more sunlight or they can receive whatever the resources that are required to expose them some, themselves best uh, and hence they are following. So it's a scientific principle why we see Fibonacci numbers so often in nature, right? That's how the golden ratio came. So I just wanted to give that uh, and let's continue. Uh, Is 13, 9 plus 25 is 34, 
and 24 and plus 64 is next 89 and so on. Isn't that really interesting? Let's see one more thing. Now what we are going to find what is called cumulative sums. What I mean by that is there are the first two numbers, first three numbers, first four numbers, first five numbers of the squares of Fibonacci. So 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 1 plus 4 is Yes, come on, tell me. 1 plus 4 is let me ask you in sequence, so you stay alert. Uh, what is next? 1 plus 1 plus 4 plus 9 is? That means 6 plus 9 is? Um, 6 plus 9. 6 plus 9. Oh, 6 for oh, 15. 15. Next is the sheet. Uh, so we know that 1 plus 1 plus 4 plus 9 will be 15. What is 15 plus 20? 20? 25. 15 plus 25 is? 40. 40, very good. Next, uh, Shri, uh, this is up to this is 40. 40 plus 64 is? 104. 104. Next, uh, Chani, uh, 104 plus 169 is? That will be 200. 73. Okay, let's start there. Do you, does, does it doesn't look like there's any, anything bad, right? 2, 6, 15, 40, 104. Looks like random numbers, right? But see care, something carefully. We can write 2 as also 1 times 2, right? Easy. 6 I can write as 2 times 3. 15 I can write as 3 times 5. 40 is 5 times 8. 104 is 8 times 13. The total 73 is 13 times 21. Check yourself. What is interesting about that? When you add the cumulative sums of the squares of Fibonacci numbers, you get product of two consecutive Fibonacci numbers. 1 times 2, 2 times 3 is a Fibonacci consecutive numbers. 3 times 5, 5 times 8, 8 times 13, 13 times 21. Isn't that interesting? Why is it that the sum, the cumulative sums, of squares of Fibonacci numbers give product of two cumulative uh, product of uh, two Fibonacci numbers. Actually, there is nothing mysterious about it. It comes out of the, the rectangle that we saw earlier. Can you switch over to the rectangle? I will show you something interesting. Why? It says, uh, yeah, you can put it in position mode. Let's see. So, see the rectangle carefully. Okay? Open it all the way up. Actually, stop there. Okay, let's talk, take any one of these. Let's take this rectangle, okay? Take this rectangle. Everybody pay attention? Mm -hmm. So, what is what do you think is the area of this rectangle? Area of the rectangle. Do you guys know the formula for the area of the rectangle? Length times width. Length times width. So, what is the length of it? It will be 21 plus, time plus 8 is 34, right? The length is, sorry, this is, uh, what's That's this? 13. Sorry, 21 times 13, right? This is 13, this is 13. It's 21. This whole thing is 21? No. No, this is 21. Plus 13. 21 plus 13, which is equal to 34. And the length is 21. 21. So that is uh, 34 times 21, right? Everybody agrees? Yes. Uh, 21 times 34 is the area of the rectangle. Everybody agrees with that? Mm -hmm. But watch out carefully. It is also equal to the sum of all the square, all the squares combined, right? Right? If you take some the area of all the squares, right? This one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are eight squares there, right? This rectangle is made up of all the squares. Do you agree? So, what is the area of the small little rectangle, little square with unit side? One. one squared is one, right? But I will write as one squared. There is one more square with one, right? The two unit squares, right? Right? Are you just following? That is the area. What is the area of the, uh, the next square? Two squared, right? Because its side length is two. Shani, do you agree? What is the area of the next one that I am going to show you? That square. Three squared. Three squared. What is the area of the next square? 
Next square. Five square. Five square. What is the area of the next square? Eight square. What is the area of the next square? Thirteen square. What is the area of the next square? Twenty-one square. Well, this is the area of the rectangle. This is also area of the rectangle. They must be equal to each other, right? Twenty-one times thirty-four. Isn't that what? It, if you write the next one, right? Twenty. The next sequence here, the twenty-one times thirty-four, wouldn't that be the same as one squared plus one squared plus two squared plus three squared plus five squared plus eight squared plus thirteen squared plus twenty-one squared? That's why when you add the sums of the squares of all this, they equal to the product of the next two Fibonacci numbers. That comes geometrically from that. Isn't that interesting? Now this is a mathematical way to show it, but you also saw why is it important for in nature so so many so many things. Why sunflowers always follow petals follow the Fibonacci numbers? Why do snails shells always have golden ratio? Why do even galaxies? In fact, if you observe even the galaxies are, are spiral and they're following the golden ratio from as small things as flower petals to as big things as galaxies are all made of that because that is the most efficient way to pack the stuff within, right? So it's not necessary. Now, my next question to you would be, do you think Fibonacci numbers are the only pattern that you can see in nature? Certainly not. Actually, there are many others. So the, we'll see the next one that we are going to see. Let me actually show you, okay? So remember this, and uh, one of the projects that, you, as I said, is a fun class, so I'm not going to give you any homework, but there is a project. One of the projects is try to find any object around your home, your school, uh, any of the areas around you, try to find some objects that follow Fibonacci in the sequence and bring it to the next class, okay? You can also draw any figure that come out of Fibonacci number, but I want you to see if you can find an object and bring it in nature, okay? Can you do that? That's one of the projects. So just go ahead and, and you can also Google it on the internet, find it on the internet, any other objects and bring it, okay? The second thing that we are going to talk about is, I will start with a triangle here. Now this is a, everybody knows a triangle, right? Mm -hmm. This is an interesting triangle. In this triangle, okay, this is like an equilateral triangle. All sides are equal. What I'm going to do next is find the midpoints of these three. Okay, I'll black this out. Now, do you see that there are three other triangles exactly similar to the previous one that come out? They're smaller, but otherwise they're exactly similar, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to do the same thing to this triangle. I'll black this out. Okay, do the same thing to this triangle. You see that there are three, 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 nine such triangles which are exactly similar to the but smaller versions of the same thing that came out. You can do the same thing again. Right? Mm -hmm. You can keep going. How long do you think I can keep cutting in? Infinitely. Infinitely. Although physically it's impossible after some time, they become so small, they will become as small as an atom eventually, or even smaller than an atom. Right? But you can, mathematically you can keep going infinitely. Now, one might argue that, look, atoms are the smallest thing that you can reach. What are no. atoms made of? What are atoms made of? Good question. So, now science, that leads us to science. Okay? And by the way, there are many interesting stories in science also. We'll probably one day do something like uh, discovering the beauty of science. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> it was believed, in fact, until a few hundred years back, not a, anybody knows that there are actually uh, atoms. Okay, only around 1800, 
uh, a scientist I, uh, by name Dad. What's his name? I forgot his name. Uh, not Dad. Is it Dad? I think Dad. He found that uh, atom actually exists. But it's though it's speculated for thousands of years that there are probably something tiny little objects called atoms of which everything is made of. Okay? But it was believed that atom was solid. It was indestructible. It was the smallest thing that everybody can get to. We can't get smaller than that. But within a few decades of that, right, probably around the end of 19th century, around the 1890s, a scientist by name J.J. Watson, I'm sorry, J.J. Thompson, who he found that actually atom is not indestructible. There are things inside atom that you can actually analyze them. He found there are electrons and there and then people found there are uh, protons, the nucleus, etc. Yes? Um, I was going to add to He thought that it was like a ball. Right, so it was like a ball. It's an indestructible hard ball. You can't make it. But within a few decades of that, they found that look, no, it's not a hard ball. There are actually things inside that, right? And after within a few decades after that, they found that in fact, atom is mostly empty space. There's actually a tiny little space within the atom called nucleus in which all the protons and neutrons are packed and there are electrons going around that, but otherwise it's mostly empty space. But then within a few decades after that, scientists found that actually protons and neutrons are the not, not the smallest ones. Uh, they are actually made of, of things called quarks. And how do you know that few decades from now, some scientists, maybe somebody from you, or maybe somebody from your generation would not find that they're actually even smaller objects. They're probably infinitely smaller than you can keep going forever, right? Science, don't take science as absolute science. That, oh, this is what I've learned and there's nothing more. Because science also evolves. For example, around beginning of the 20th century, right, around 1903, right, brothers, actually showed that you can fly, right? They invented the flying objects. But just a few decades before that, many scientists, very well-known scientists, there was a scientist called Lord Kelvin, um, who was very famous. He actually invented uh, one of the founding principles of in science called thermodynamics. He was one of the core founders of that. And he said that it is based on scientific scientific principles, it is impossible for a lighter than, uh, a heavier than air object, a man-made heavier than uh, uh, object to actually fly. Impossible. Scientifically it's not possible. Well, within a few decades it was found wrong, right? Because flight was, within 1903, it was actually flew. And within a few decades after that, the flight, everybody flies. Nowadays, we routinely fly. If you want to, if you're a cousin in New York, you fly, right? You went to India, you fly. So do take what you know in science today as absolute, okay? Have curiosity, have a, uh, have a uh, curiosity to go and explore, okay? What are some of the things that you could possibly, that are not possible today? but might be actually possible in a few decades or a few, maybe take, some of them might take a few centuries. Think, can you tell a few of such things? Something bigger than blue whale. Something bigger than blue whale, okay. Bigger than blue whale, okay. Any other thing, anything in any, any subject area that you can, not possible today, but you can find. Yes? Destroying the law of gravity. Destroying law of gravity, okay. That is basically, uh, of proving that there's something other than law of gravity. You can actually define the law of gravity. Yeah. Define law of gravity. Okay, yeah. Good one. Yes, Sri? When using programs without a computer, like you can like well, it's not like not a computer, but you can like you can also do it on your iPad and stuff like that. Yeah, you can take other other objects and do that, yes, Sorry. Time travel? Time travel, that's a good one. Time travel today is not possible. There are no time machines, but that's just today's technologies. Maybe in future it's possible. How about, yeah? Growing another limb. Growing? Another limb, if not. Growing a limb, in fact, okay. Good, that's actually a great one. 
Although probably there's already progress being made in some of those areas here. Yeah? Anything else? Anybody heard about teleportation? Anybody heard about what is teleportation? Do you know what is teleportation? Uh, yeah. Anybody? Yeah? Yeah? Transporting from one place to another. You can, you can transport one person. Yeah, in a second. Yeah, actually, no time. Disappear here and appear somewhere else. Today, actually, in some of the scientific labs, science have, scientists have already done it at atomic level. Okay? Particles, initially, they did with a photon, which is a light particle, but then they actually did with a material particle, like an atom, disappear from one place and at the same time appear in a different place. If you can do it at atomic level, what are we made of? Atoms, ultimately, right? If you can reconstruct the whole atomic structure of, a, of, a, of you and reconstruct there, you're there. Now, today, we can't do it at a macroscopic level like a, like, a, like a thing. But in a few decades, it may be possible. Yes? Um, flying cars. Flying cars. In fact, we're probably very close to that. Well, there are driverless cars already. There are, there are flights, there are driverless cars. Maybe someday it's possible, yeah? Rearranging atoms. Rearranging atoms. Rearranging atoms. Uh, what do you mean by that? Like if you take one object and just rearrange the atoms, you can make another object. Out of oh, convert one atom to another? Mm -hmm. Some of them are actually possible today. Uh, actually, uh, atomic reactions are based on that. Good one. Yeah. Sorry. Um, taking a person to the sun. Take a person to the sun. Okay. Today, if, even if we can find an object, a, a we rocket that can take will get burnt out. But maybe you find a technology not to do that. Okay, take a person to sun. Is she? Um, explore different galaxies. Explore to different galaxies. Go to different galaxies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. How about uh, invisibility? Can you disappear mm -hmm. yourself? Isn't that cool? How many Harry Potter? Isn't that cool in Harry Potter? You can have an invisibility cloak, right? Can you? Now, today's using today's technology is probably is not possible, but scientists can do it at a small level. Maybe you can do it at a bigger level, and then just wear and you can't find me anymore. Mm -hmm. Then, yeah? To stop light. Stop light, just stop light. Okay? Light goes at a constant speed, but maybe you can just stop it. Okay? Stop light. Yes? Um, bring back people from the dead. Bring back people from the dead. My God, you are really imaginative. Yes? Oh, yeah. Um, automatic, automatic knowledge, like when you're born. You got to not just right on the side. Okay, yeah. So the reason I okay, we'll stop there because we'll run out of time. But the reason I want to bring this out is when we talk about science, known science, don't think think that as impossible. At some point everybody thought today's things are impossible. In your generation, I can guarantee you in your generation, uh, some of these things will be done. Now hopefully it may be it's from this room. But, but I can guarantee you that in your generation you will find these things and many other things, right? So have that uh, scientific curiosity, okay? And hopefully we'll do something about science. This is not science, it's math. But math and science are heavily related, okay? And we'll one day do something like discovering the science, beauty of science. We'll spend more time on these things like, like this. But I wanted to give you a plan on that. Yes? Um, this is just uh, one thing to add on to that. I just thought of it now. And, um, Instead of like getting gas, like for cars, we can like, um, I actually found this on the internet, I was trying to do this project and it's for new technologies. And they said that they'll put like something on the roads, which um, when you drive on it, it would have like, the car would have like a sensor and it'll get power from the, like the wheels. Yeah, the road. yeah, absolutely. There are many things that are thought, thought impossible uh, today are going to become possible. So have that scientific curiosity. Hopefully we'll spend more time on this. But coming back to this thing, okay? <laughs> Where did we start? We got distracted a little bit, but hopefully it's a good distraction, right? Uh, see, this can go, keep going forever, infinitely small. I think that's where we started. Smaller than atom, and smaller than electron, smaller than quark, and infinitely smaller. But at least mathematically speaking, do you know what is this called? Such a thing called. This is called, well, it's a self-repeating thing, right? You start with something and it keeps repeating itself at a smaller scale. There is a name for it. Any guess? 
No, they're called fractals. You heard the name fractal? Yeah. Fractals. Yes. Sorry, computer. Sorry, on the computer. Yeah. Fractals are self-repeating geometric objects. They keep repeating again and again. Interesting thing about this is there's many objects in nature which do that. Okay. At this point, I'm going to show you another video. Today, let's have some fun with fractals. To start with, what are fractals? You've probably seen tons of fractals in nature, but you just did not know that they are fractals. One example is the fern in this image. Here's what a whole fern looks like. Now if we zoom into one leaf, look, it looks like the whole fern. Now let's zoom in even more and look at this, it looks like the fern again. Some flowers are also fractal. At first sight, if we see this bunch of flowers, we can see that the bunch is made up of many small flowers. But actually, if you look closer, each of the small flowers is made up of even smaller portions. Just the same way that each portion makes up the small flowers, each small flower also makes up the whole bunch. So each of these smaller portions is in fact similar to each of the flowers and even to the bunch. This is also an example of a fractal pattern. Another fractal is a broccoli. And don't we all really love broccoli? Do you love broccoli? As you can see, each of the heads of the broccoli of resembles the vegetable as a whole. Now that you've seen these examples of fractals, you can probably spot your next fractal in nature by yourself. So what exactly are fractals? The word fractals comes from the Latin verb to break. Fractals are geometric patterns in which every smaller part of the structure is similar to the whole. So and there are many, and you can we start with the triangle, you can start with other things also. And one of the projects for you, the second project for you this week is going to be either try to find an object, it is a natural object like fractals. You can take some examples from this, you can do your Google research, but bring that object or other than triangle, draw another fractal. Obviously you cannot write, draw it infinitely small, but draw it as many levels as you can. You can draw it on graph paper or something. Okay? That's going to be your second project. Okay? Now by the way, I'm going to give you a handout at the end similar to this that has uh, not everything that I talked today about is not possible, but uh, with a brief summary of that and also projects are written. So you will have the projects in your uh, handout. Okay? So those are fractals. Uh, so these are uh, Fibonacci numbers and fractals are two examples of things mathematical patterns that you find in nature. Do you think those are the only two things? No. Yeah. There are many, many, many other patterns. But, uh, and some of you, uh, obviously we don't have the time to go over all of them now. If any of you, uh, we have a, a class called Math Genius that actually happens after the summer. And uh, some of you are there in uh, the class. It starts in, from August and goes through the academic year. We will talk about a lot more like this and we like to spend more time on the patterns and many more interesting patterns actually. And you will solve some problems based on that. Um, but one interesting question is, who found all this? Yes? Newton. Newton found all these patterns, okay. Uh, so before Newton, nobody knew anything about this? <laughs> okay. I guess. Yes? Pupil, humans, okay. Yeah, that's a good question. Answer. <laughs> it can't be wrong. Yeah. Huh? Caveman. Caveman. Okay, some caveman found it. Yeah. No? Yeah? Living beings. Living beings. <laughs> no, let's be animals and insects found this, right? A plant did it? <laughs> Aliens. Plants might have done it, yeah. Aliens. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, so, no one person found it. It found over a period of time by a lot of people. But uh, what I'm <clears throat> to really appreciate how things evolve in terms of mathematics, but will also help in the general history of science and general history of humankind in general. What I'm going to do now is a brief timeline of last 10 to 12,000 years. So we're going really back in time. Okay, not as old as the universe, which is about 15 billion dollars, or not even Earth, which is five billion dollars. Not in the entire humankind, which is probably over 100,000 years, but we'll go to about 10 to 
12,000 years. And when I talk about this, suddenly you feel like our time is tiny, tiny, small. <laughs> right? So, uh, I'll show you a presentation. Okay, I mean, let's go to the beginning of that. So, uh, I'm going to give you a broad timeline of things they are, and as we go through, I'll focus on certain periods when a lot of research happened, okay? So, uh, that line shows the time on a straight line. And the first, to the right most point over here, is some more time, that is today, that's the 21st century, today, okay? The 7th of June 2014 is, let's say, today. And on the other end of the line, all the way at the uh, left, is, let's say, 10,000 BC. That is 10,000 years before Krishna. That's about more than 12,000. Let's say about 12,000 years from today, right? Because we are uh, in the 21st century, so it's about uh, 2,000 years after that, right? So total about 12,000 years. Next, so just as a reference point, that is a year zero, okay? So everything after that is we say AD. Everything before that we say BC, right? You are familiar with that, okay? One more, so then we put lines, every thousand years is one of those small lines, okay? One more, uh, let's pause there for a second. So, uh, around 3500 BC, or about 5500 years from back from today, that's one, that's when writing was invented. How do you know that? How do you know what happened in, yes? In some caves there are drawings. Good one. Somebody wrote it down. Wrote there. China? But where did they write? On paper. Was there paper at the time? <laughs> was, there, was there pencil at the time? There was, there was ink. Yeah. Pens. Right. But therefore, okay. There are some which were written, right? Uh, because we talked about archaeology a little while back, right? Archaeology is the study where scientists dig and find what happened, like caves, with things written, etc. And some people wrote on clay tablets. There is a civilization we're going to talk in a while called Mesopotamian civilization, which is of roughly today's Iraq. Egyptian civilization, which is today is Egypt, and uh, Indus Valley civilization, which is part of northern India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Uh, in those civilizations, they actually people uh, left many things, and if you dig and they found objects written around that period, they, obviously they could not find anything before that. So, time. Uh, writing was roughly found to be around that time. But between 10,000 BC to 3,500 BC, uh, I 10,000 BC roughly, I took randomly some date because archaeological uh, evidence has found a uh, few things that between those around uh, 6,500 years or so, writing was not there. People did not have writing, but they still found many things uh, that people actually use numbers for things. For example, now a lot of people around that time, particularly before a couple of civilizations, I'm going to I talked about Mesopotamian, Egyptian, Indian, Indus Valley civilizations, etc. People were hunter gatherers, right? You had about, you read those uh, in somewhere in history class, right? People used to go and find animals to eat, right? That's before farming was invented. Farming probably was invented some in Mesopotamian civilization initially and then it spread uh, in Asia and uh, Africa and Europe uh, in the, what is today called a fertile crescent. If you see in the map around, uh, around West Asia, uh, part of uh, southern, southeastern Europe, uh, fertile and North Africa, that's where initially farming came. But before that, People live as hunter gatherers, so they need to count things, right? They need to count, let's say, how many animals did they gather today, right? How will they know? Well, what do you think the first numbers they could have used? They might have used, yes? Romans. Oh, never mind. Romans came only uh. two thousand years back. We're talking about far before that. I'm not talking about what kind of numbers they wrote. What do you think? Yes. Tally, yeah. But do you think they would have used fractions? They start with fractions. What do you think they would have started with? Like one, 
to, they may not have written in this like this, they could have not even Roman numerals, they would have used some numerals, right? In fact, they did not use to write. There was, there was no writing at the time. So they could not write Roman numerals. My point is, they, they needed counting, right? Do you think they would have started with zero? No. no. Why would you count uh, zero animals, right? That's like no animal, right? Nobody says, I have zero cows. You say, I have one cow, I have ten cows, I have no cows, right? So there was no zero. But interestingly, actually, uh, archaeological evidence found found that initially they probably used stones, pebbles, small stone, pebbles to count. But if I, if I want to say, I, uh, I got five animals today, I hunted five animals today, they used to get five stones to represent five animals. If, I, if you uh, want to say, I crossed ten trees, you would say ten pebbles to count things, right? But, yeah, what are pebbles, right? By the way, any of you heard about this field of math called calculus? You don't know obviously how to do it, but you heard about the calculus? Many of you heard, right? Do you know what does it mean, calculus? What does it actually the word means? Not today, but originally how it came from? It actually means in Latin pebble, a stone. Because people used to use pebbles or stones to count, the calculus, the word is used for calculating, means pebbles for calculation. And even the word calculation, calculation means counting, or, or you know, uh, mathematically arithmetic, right? Calculation that came from the word stone because stone was used for counting in the beginning. Okay? That's how people used to count. But especially when some of the civilization started, okay? Like the uh, next one. Especially when uh, some of the civilization like the Mesopotamian civilization, and Valley civilization, and Egyptian civilization I talked about, what is this what do you mean by when civilization started? People started Instead of going around from place to place and hunting and gathering, they used to start settling down in one place. And they started farming, they started domesticating animals, getting cows, getting uh, uh, dogs, getting donkeys, uh, uh, and then domesticating plants, farming, growing grains. All those started probably slightly before writing and after that, but those are called civilization. That's when we say ancient civilization started, that's what it started with. And those people, uh, when they now the moment you start farming, right, you can also, have, you will have probably more form, more grains than what you need, right, if you, but then what do you do with that? You can trade it with some other people, maybe, you stopped hunting, but the other people who were hunting, you can trade maybe three sacks of grain for five animals they hunted, right? That's trading. And initially they used to do barter. There was no money, right? So you, if I give sacks of grain, you give me animals or whatever you need, right? But to do that, you're counting again. You have said three sacks and I have five animals, but you have to count now. And that's when they pebbles more, but they also started on the, when the writing, especially when writing invented, they started writing it on clay tablets and uh, in Egypt they used to call papyrus, which is the previous form of, uh, uh, very early form of graph. Uh, and so count, and, that, and that's why these numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, are called counting numbers. They are also sometimes called natural numbers because people started using for counting nature. So that's why called natural numbers. Zero was not part of it. In fact, zero, as I said earlier, uh, while talking about Fibonacci, right? This was invented by Indian mathematicians later, which came to Arab, and finally Fibonacci introduced it to Europe. But until then, zero wasn't there. Then fractions, rational numbers came later, and finally, other numbers came. How these civilizations flourished at different periods, but uh, but around between 1000 BC to 500 BC, okay, 
farming advanced so much that people had more time out. Because earlier, when you were only hunting and gathering, everybody was busy. You have to go hunt and get your food today, otherwise you, you will not survive. And there were no good houses, there were animals around. Just to survive, they have to take the whole day. Right? That's all people need today, just like animals do well, today. But the moment farming came, people can grain, grow more grains, more food. Now people have time, right? And then they started different professions. Somebody specializing in profession. Some people just do farming. Some people only are soldiers, so can fight with other countries. Uh, no, there are no countries at the time, other territories, to get hold of, uh, to have bigger empires, right? And people, some people used to just do uh, plumbing, uh, carpentry, different professions came. But also, around 500 BC or later, in different parts of the world, some people are, uh, uh, emerged whom, uh, in those days, they used to be called as philosophers. Today, some of them you might call them scientists, some of them as mathematicians, some of them doing some research, some for trying to find something new for others, everybody to follow, right? The first few, from our point, mathematicians in different parts of the world started specializing in that. And that happened in many parts of the world, but unfortunately, the written history of most of other places are gone, except one place where they're very well documented. We know their history very well. They are the ancient Greeks. The Greeks, especially between, if you please, one more time, especially between around 500 BC, the large box, 500 BC to 200 BC. Okay, this 500 during these 300 years, this is called the Greek classical period, 500 BC to 200 BC. A number of People whom we can call mathematicians, they did not use the word mathematician at the time, but whom we can call mathematicians today started researching about and, do, and try, uh, started finding mathematical patterns. They are probably first documented civilization people to uh, first identify the nature, the numbers in the nature. Others probably found earlier, they just did not document it, but the mathematics as we know today probably started with that and it's well documented. As I said, others, Indians, Chinese, Arabs also did research but they, most of it did not survive. But the Greeks, whatever they did, they well documented and they survived. The people before them, like you know, for thousands of years before that, the Mesopotamians and Egyptians and Indian civilizations I talked about, they had a lot of number knowledge. Apart from counting, they had other number knowledge. For example, uh, there was an Egyptian papyrus that was found uh, that shows some, how many of you know Pythagoras theorem. Some of you know, some of you. But, okay. Pythagoras, by the way, is another mathematician, Greek mathematician from this period. What, and moment I show probably you recognize what it means. What Pythagoras theorem says is that the, if you take a right triangle like this, okay, this is called, these two are called lines. This is called smaller like, this is called longer like, this is called hypotenuse. Okay? This is hypotenuse, okay? Oh, good. Okay. Uh, sorry, your pranaya, right? Yeah. What this says is that the sum of the squares of these two legs is equal to the square of the hypotenuse. Anybody heard that? If this is called, if you call this A, B, and C, A squared plus B squared equal to C squared, and square of this plus square of this plus equal to square of this. This was, now, this, as a theorem, as a general principle, as a general pattern was found by Pythagoras who is a Greek mathematician and his followers and they actually did a lot of research on this. But if you go to Mesopotamian and Egyptian class, uh, time, but especially a, an Egyptian papyrus was found which shows that there are people, they actually found that there are three number three. If you have a, a leg of three, like size three, another leg of size four and hypotenuse is five, they knew that these three fit each other. They also knew that 3 squared, which is equal to 9, plus 4 squared, which is equal to 16, is equal to 9 plus 16 is equal to 5 squared, which is 25. But they only knew about these specific numbers, not about the general principles that if you take any right triangle, the sum of these square, like, squares of two legs is always equal to the square of the hypotenuse. 
that was documented by the Greeks. And so what we can call as mathematics today, many of these guys have started and the Europeans, Western Europeans follow that more and more, right? But what is interesting about these uh, Greeks is, ancient Greeks is, they actually uh, found so many of these patterns. And in fact, next week when we go talk about another topic called platonic solid, find them, uh, they did more research. And in fact, the name itself comes from one of the Greek, uh, Greek philosophers. And, uh, and they are the first, so to our question, who started all this? They're probably, and there are probably people before them who asked the question, but these guys have documented and survived. But many mathematicians after that uh, followed that too. Uh, so I said 500 to 200 BC. What happened after 200 BC? What happened to Greece? Do you know the history of that? Yes? Troy? Troy was before that. Huh? You have Romans? Romans took over Greece. Right. Romans actually come toward Greece around that time. And from 200 BC to about 580, about 700 years, that is a Roman period. Romans dominated Europe. Now, obviously, we're talking about European history. The other things happening in other parts of the world, which are not said, you can, uh, not as well, well documented. The dates are not as clear, but you can find those histories as well. And from 500 AD, after the Romans, to about 1200, like we talked about earlier, it's called Dark Ages in Europe. In other parts of the world, in Arab world, Indians, Chinese, there are a lot of interesting things happened. There are a lot of interesting mathematicians we are going to talk about. But Europe went through what is known as a dark period at that time, where religious beliefs took precedence, took importance over scientific and mathematical thought. So science and math is supposed to went down, and people did not do much research, but Christianity took strong hold. And there are also even religious wars between Christianity and uh, Islam, which also came around 7th century AD. They all, uh, but about 700 years, we, up until 12th, uh, 12, 13th centuries, it, it kind of seen as the dark ages. But after that, if you can some more, uh, from, uh, so that is the dark ages we talked about, from 500 to about 200 AD. But starting around 14th century to 17th century, it's called Renaissance, where in Europe, again, they started initially cultural revolution, arts and drawings and paintings. They started with, with that, but eventually that led to scientific revolution where we have modern science today. But especially during this period of Renaissance, a lot of European scientists and mathematicians started asking interesting questions and they started finding many of these patterns, but they also went back to the Greek time and uh, Roman time to find what they were done. And uh, in Greek history, uh, especially, there's one particular uh, Greek philosopher, his name is Plato. They believed that by the mathematics is the art of nature. Greeks said that actually. And this particular mathematician uh, is not a mathematician, he's a philosopher. Uh, there was a uh, there was a say, there was a uh, story about him that he has an academy he used to teach. He's a philosopher. And uh, he has a caption at the beginning, at the front of his, econ uh, his academy that no person ignorant of mathematics can enter here. Okay, that's what he believed. Uh, and but uh, there are others like uh, as I talked about Pythagoras, who not only did this but he found a lot of other things. And one of the things Greeks believed is that, uh, by the way, Greeks already knew that Earth was spherical. Although sometimes you hear stories like, oh, uh, until recently, until maybe during Columbus when he went on to find India and found America, right? People thought it, Earth was flat. That's not true. The educated people, by Columbus generation, which is about five, six hundred years back, they knew that Earth was actually curved. Uh, no, though although nobody saw it's spherical, right? Because how do you see? There's no satellites, no telescope, nothing, right? But they believe it's called based on other indirect evidence. In fact, the Greeks, who doc, again as I said documented, uh, but others probably Indian and Chinese mathematics, uh, philosophers know that as well, that Earth was actually not flat. Earth was spherical. In fact, they believed so much that from a mathematical viewpoint, they thought all heavenly objects, including Earth, Sun, Moon, all planets, all of them are spherical. 
because they believe that the sphere is the most perfectly symmetrical object, so the God created everything in spherical things. Uh, although it is not exactly sphere, we know that right today, but they don't know that. They don't, but most common people don't even know that it is spherical. It is only to some of the philosophers who believe that, yes. They even know that, they even thought that, um, that it didn't even revolve in orbit and all the other um, celestial objects in space revolved, including the sun. Right, in fact, that's it. So, Greeks actually believed, and in fact, there's one of them, uh, there's a, there's a uh, person called Ptolemy, who was a uh, uh, librarian of one of the greatest librarians for a period of the time of Alexandria, in today's Egypt, but this part of the Greek Empire at the time. He wrote a book codifying all the, I mean, documenting all the Greek thought. And he came up with this theory, and he did not The theory was brought up by many uh, Greek philosophers, starting with uh, uh, Pythagoras, but by many other, believed by many other uh, philosophers, including Aristotle, but finally written by Ptolemy uh, that Earth is in the middle, okay, and all other celestial objects, heavenly objects, including Sun and Moon and all planets revolve around the Earth in in circular object, exactly circular object, because just like a sphere, the circle is a perfectly perfectly symmetrical thing, right? A sphere uh, and this and at the middle. But if you think about them, you should sympathize with them. If you don't know, if you don't have satellites, if you don't have all the modern uh, technology, if you, if you don't have telescopes to observe all the heavenly objects in detail, wouldn't you think that Earth is not moving? Why would you think? Do you see Earth moving? No, Earth is not moving, right? Why would you think Earth is moving? If Earth is moving, why are you not flying away? Right? So it was natural for people before you knew all the modern science that Earth is stationary. And but you also see that in the night, the planets are moving, the moon is moving, the day sun is going around. So it is natural to believe that everything else is going around Earth, right? That's what they believe. But they also believe that it's circular, although later, Scientists found that it is not circular actually, it is actually elliptical. But what is even more interesting, so for the next 1500 years after Greeks, everybody accepted that this, this theory that Earth is in the middle. And by the way, uh, all the religious uh, facts, religion also accepted it because religion always thought human beings are special, that God created us, so we got to be in the center. Right? But the question is then, who moved the earth? Who said that we are, earth is not in the middle, but sun is in the middle and everybody goes around, everything here goes around? Plato. Plato, oh, Plato was a Greek. I said for the next 1500 years uh -huh. after Greeks, everybody still believed that, yes? Nico was Copernicus. Copernicus, yeah. Is it Galileo? Actually, all of them contributed, although it's a whole different story by itself. We don't have time for that, we are out of time. But it's again more of science than math. Again, probably that story will talk more about in a similar class for science, like discovering the beauty of science. It's a very interesting, fascinating story. Many important players are there in how uh, how we finally move the earth, right? Uh, that earth is not stationary. But we'll talk about that, we're running out of time. So, uh, as, so finally, as you go through the history, during the Renaissance, many of these things are found. Many, science, many mathematicians during that period brought back many of the Greek thoughts. And finally, uh, more research was done, until, even, even now. One of those, somebody talked about Galileo, right? Galileo Galilei is a, another Egyptian, uh, sorry, Italian uh, philosopher, scientist, mathematician. He also, he, he actually was a very close follower of Greek thoughts, and he said, he said a very famous uh, saying that if the nature is a book, right? It's an analogy, obviously. If you think nature is like a book, its language is mathematics. Okay, and he came up with and he gave examples using many other things that he thought about, right? 
So with that, we'll close today's class. And next week, by the way, Greeks also believed that there are another five interesting symmetrical objects, which is the topic of next week's class. And we'll actually build some of those. They're three dimensional things. They're really fascinating. Um, but I will give you your handouts. Go through the handouts one more time. Go through the projects and do the projects. Okay? Any questions before we discuss? No? Yes? Did Archimedes um, contribute to that? Like Absolutely. But Archimedes. Archimedes was another Greek philosopher, Greek science. He was considered actually one of the greatest mathematicians ever. Uh, definitely one of the, uh, probably uh, during the ancient times, which is over 2000 years back, one of the greatest mathematicians and whom we can call probably an architect or engineer today. He, he was many things. Uh, he definitely contributed a lot to that. Uh, he's in fact, he came very close to inventing what we call today call as calculus. We will talk about this when we talk about in third or fourth class, when we talk about calculus, we talk about more about Archimedes. Uh, he kept very close to inventing it, which was finally not invented until the 17th century, which is almost 1800 years after that. But he came very close to that. It is very important But a good question. But uh, if you don't take away anything from this class, I want you to take curiosity. I want you to don't take the just facts. Hopefully, these facts will help you do more research. Okay. Uh, and the projects are also giving you the same thing, not to make you do your homework, but to actually for you to go and explore things, find interesting things. And hopefully you'll carry some of this much longer. Okay? Any other questions? If not, we're, we're done for today and see you all next week at 1.30. Okay? Bye.